Chris Fussell, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Appreciate you having me on. Looking forward to the discussion here. Oh, well, you got a new book out, One Mission, How Leaders Build a Team of Teams. It's a follow-up to your book that you wrote with General Stanley McChrystal, Team of Teams. Uh, before we get into the idea of Team of Teams and One Mission, I think a little back, a little bit about your background would be helpful because it'll explain a lot of what's going on here. So can you walk us through your background and what, what got you to the point where you're writing a book called One Mission and Team of Teams? Sure. I'll, I'll try to start where it gets relevant. I, in, in the late 90s, I graduated college in 1996 and went into the Navy after that and directly into the SEAL pipeline. So I started SEAL basic training, the BUDS program in 97. And then in 98, I joined the, the SEAL teams on the East Coast, the U.S. and Virginia. Spent the next 15 years in that community inside the special operations world, specifically in the SEAL teams that entire time, but working with a broad swath of other other services and then sort of interagency partners until 2012 when I left active duty. Obviously, in the years after 2001, the, the world ch- has changed dramatically and, and the military had to adjust the way it did operations over, overseas as a result of this new type of conflict that we find ourselves in battle inside of. And the special operations community was in a very interesting and complex part of this global fight. So I'm sure your your listeners have, are all well aware of how, how dramatically those communities have changed in the last 15 years or so. And so I had the unique optic to be in, involved in a at multiple levels in that change process. First, as a, as a sort of a junior officer inside those communities in the years after 2001, and then sort of rising up to, to mid, mid-management sort of positions at the operational level. And then one year in my career, I, was, uh, I spent as then three-star Lieutenant General McChrystal's aide-de-camp, his last year of five years that he commanded a, a global task force specifically focused on counterterrorism. So in that year, I w- we were basically forward deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan for about a year straight. And I was able to sort of sit right next to General McChrystal and other senior leaders in that community. And having experienced the change from the, from the ground level, I was then able to sort of witness the organizational processes as a, you know, an observer to that, that staff, which was just a fascinating process for me to, to sort of see behind the curtain and say, oh, this is how we've gotten so much better. Not at battlefield operations that we had amazing units on the ground that were just improving exponentially, but at the synchronization of this global enterprise. There was an amazing process behind that. So when, when I left service in 2012, partnered with General McChrystal, who had created a, what we call the McChrystal Group. And we had started doing work with industry, helping them consider similar changes uh, in their sort of global operating model. And about four or five years ago, we started having this conversation. Let's, let's work on a book that tries to capture these lessons. So that was the origins of Team of Teams. And what we found was that as we started to dig into that subject, we realized there, there's a lot here. So the first book, Team of Teams, is very focused on sort of the macro theory of the case. What has changed in the world? And our thinking led us to some deep discussion in Team of Teams around the information age, the speed with with which individuals can connect, share ideas, create actions. That's, That's increased the complexity in the world on orders of magnitude just in the last 10 years or so. And the argument we made in that initial book was that Traditional systems aren't capable through strict bureaucracy of dealing with that level of speed and interconnectedness that now sort of swarms us everywhere we look. So that was the idea of the first book. And then when we finished that, we realized there's, there's more to be said here. What are the processes that actually allowed the enterprise that Mercosul oversaw and other organizations that are going through this to change the way they operate, to react to this, this big change that we're all dealing with? And so that's what we focus on inside of one mission. And as we finished up Team of Teams, had a long conversation with McChrystal and he encouraged me, hey, you sat on the staff and observed this. You should write the next book from that optic as a person who was sort of not in the senior leadership team, but watching how they did business. And then I went on, after that, I'd gone on to grad school and done some thesis work on how those systems were working. And so that was the origins of of one mission. And so 
we're pretty excited now that the two go in in great complement to each other. The theory of the case, the change we're all dealing with, and here's a practicum on how you can actually implement this sort of change model inside your organization. That's awesome. For our listeners who aren't familiar with the changes that the military went through, particularly the special operations part of the military, what, how was, how did the military organize itself before these changes, and how was the way they operated? Why did it like not work? Well, the, the, the military is, like in, in simple terms, very much like any other big enterprise. It's, it's structured in, in a top-down sort of fashion. And this is not to attack traditional hierarchical approach. There, there is a lot of strength inside of that system. And you know, over the past 100 years or so, say in the, in the industrial age, uh, c- collectively, you know, many folks around the world have learned those systems and refined them to a near as near perfect state as one could hope. You know, we've seen that in industry, we've seen that in governments, we've seen that in the military. And that is all premised on the idea that I have enough subject matter experts that can read the environment, predict what is likely to happen. And that could be predicting what products people will want, what the next election cycle will look like, what our enemy on the battlefield is most likely to do based on their supply chain, their leadership model, the terrain, et cetera. All the, the underlying foundation of those systems is very similar. And so that's the type of system that I came into. Even inside of the special operations, it, the operations that had gone for, on for years in that world were premised on the predictability of the environment. And so you could then say, okay, here's what's likely to happen, or here's, what, here's what's just happened and what will occur next. Therefore, here's the unit we're going to use to address that issue. They will go out, they will execute an operation, they will come back with new intelligence, and then we will decide what we do next. What we found in the early years of the conflict in Iraq was that the technology age, you know, which was created in an entirely different space than what we found on the battlefield, but they, the threats that we were facing there were leveraging what we now consider just sort of commonplace realities of the information age. You know, you can connect with people very quickly over email and cell phones. And now you can create massive amounts of followers on Twitter. And there's just countless things that you can do in the information age to connect individuals around ideas that simply didn't exist when the models that we had come to be so comfortable with were developed. So this 20th century sort of traditional top-down model versus a massively distributed problem set, the the two are, don't, don't marry up very well. And I would argue what most organizations and what we were feeling in the military was the the distributed model. Think of it as a just a mass flash mob. Uh, it, it's not going to necessarily beat or destroy this big traditional system, but it will bite away at it in so many different parts all at once that eventually the big system just sort of can collapse under its its own weight. And what we found on the battlefield was you know, Al Qaeda being our first sort of understanding of these distributed networks, they didn't have some massive, you know, great plan that they were going to put in place. It was going to, they were going to replace system with, with sheer chaos and introduce, you know, some, some uh, very deliberate ideology into that vacuum. But that's not what they were worried about. They weren't trying to create, you know, a, a nation state to replace the old system. They are intent on creating chaos into which you can then, inject whatever idea set you, you want to. So that was sort of the, the, the tension in the fight that we found at a systems level. We have, we have a model built on premises that no longer exist facing a network threat that has no rules. It just, it, it exists on a, a narrative that's strong enough to pull in followers and it can grow exponentially in a very short order. And I guess we're seeing that in full force recently in Europe with all these sort of terrorist attacks that just come out of nowhere. There's no hierarchy. It's just network. People who are keyed into that narrative and they decide to do something about that with that narrative. That's right. And that's, there's a really interesting part to all of this, which is, you know, what is it that makes networks in any space in, you know, in, 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 in the way a nation runs itself, in the way a military functions, in the way a group like this is put together, the, the networks that have this sort of really powerful narrative that is very attractive to people. And that's not a judgment on whether it's good or bad. You might think it's a, it's an evil narrative, 
But it doesn't really matter what you think. It matters what people are willing to become part of that thing. And if you connect with enough of a followership, like we're seeing in Europe and other parts of the world, you know, folks will flood from pockets all around the globe now to be part of something that they think has great meaning. And so that's why, you know, the idea of fighting an information age war, or the information campaign, it's not new, but we're seeing it. It's just a very, very intense part of the struggle right now is, look, the, until the story catches up with the, the realities on the ground, we're always going to be one step behind these things because they do tell a very powerful narrative to those that w- wish to be part of them. We saw the first stages of that in Iraq in the early days, and now it's just continued to grow over the last 10 or 12 years. Yeah, as I was reading your book, and the ideas, it made me think about John Boyd's OODA loop and how what he was writing 50 years ago, like we're starting to see manifest itself today with um, these sort of network terror cells and like how, and he said like, this is how we need to respond. Like he was probably talking about, he was talking about guerrilla fighters in Vietnam mm-hmm. who acted very similar. And he said, in order to combat them, you needed to, we needed to change the way we operated in, on, a, on, the, on the military level. And so you kind of implemented this idea of the OODA loop. It often gets simplified, mm-hmm. um, but it's very complex where it's all about, just constantly taking information and making decisions rapidly on that information so you can combat the enemy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, Boyd's got an interesting history inside the Air Force. It was never promoted up to a very senior level because his ideas were probably contradictory to a lot of big systems thinkers. And this, this is how you structure a big enterprise. And I think they, they were probably folks that saw Boyd as too much of an outlier or sort of a threat to traditional thinking. But he's a fighter pilot, so he started at the small level, which, to your point, it often gets simplified down to that. But he was actually a big systems thinker. But the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act, his, was his foundational argument that said, look, if you can get a, an individual in a, in a fighter jet to do those things in sequence faster than the person in the enemy fighter jet, they will win in the dogfight. They can observe the situation, orient themselves, their thinking, and their aircraft to it, make a decision about what they're going to do next, and take action. The tighter you can make that loop, which is dependent on all sorts of out, outside variables and their, their ability to triage very quickly, then they will shoot down the other fighter, which you know makes total sense if you think of a sort of top gun scenario, two, two airplanes dogfighting, which doesn't really happen in today's air-to-air conflict anymore, just based on weapon systems. But it's a, it's a logical, sort of easy to understand concept. Scaling that up to the enterprise is where it gets really, really challenging. And you know, it's funny you mentioned Boyd, because on the as we started to feel these changes inside of the counterterrorism task force that, that McChrystal oversaw, people started to throw that language around to say, wow, we, we, we're speeding up the OODA loop of this global enterprise. I mean, this is thousands of people spread around the world and, you know, multiple countries in every time zone, but acting as a unified whole to be able to reorient all the strength of that system against a very specific problem and make a decision, take an action within a matter of minutes sometimes. So the ability to do that was a whole new way of, of thinking. So sometimes if it's, it, as we're talking with industry leaders, I'll often start there if, if they have some sort of background understanding of, of Boyd's theories to say, look, you can now scale this up to the enterprise level and, and really orient yourselves globally very quickly. And what was the transition like from this top down? I mean, I think you call it dotted line high art structure, right? Where there's a chain of command where you wait, you get your orders from someone else and they get the orders from someone else. And then to more of this distributed model, talk a little more, it's more of a hybrid model. We'll talk about what, you mean, what that means. But what was the transition like? Did it, were there a lot of people who were, you know, who dug their heels in? They're like, no, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. We got to do it the way we've always done it. Or were people pretty open to that? Yeah. In one mission, we talk about sort of the solid line, traditional hierarchy, coupled with dotted line, sort of distributed networks. So if you anybody that's worked in a big enterprise has stories or can talk directly to, yeah, we were structured this way, but to actually get business done with this division or this department, you had to go to this person and that person. So what they're doing is they're describing these sort of darker networks that exist inside of enter- any enterprise. So that's always existed. I think what McChrystal and the senior leadership started to realize was how can we put a place, a structure in place that identifies and leverages those networks because that's where things happen really fast in a big enterprise. That's where key relationships sit. That's where interesting, unknown decision makers lie within the organization. So how can we couple those with the strength of the traditional solid line system? If we can bring those two things together, then we can have the stability, power, et cetera, of a traditional system, which we don't want to lose, 
and move with the speed and distributed nature of these networks that we're fighting. Now, all that sounds great in hindsight. I think to your, to your other question, what did, what did that change process feel like? It was very organic, very sort of let's, let's pursue what works and cast off what doesn't work. There was not a master plan that was put down on paper and said, here's where we are. Here's how we're structured. Here's what the new threat looks like. Therefore, here's a, a 24 month change cycle that we're going to go through, you know, a very traditional approach because the new, the problem was so new and the senior leadership that started to have this conversation, they just said, okay, what we're doing now isn't working. We're, we're, we're pushing the traditional system as hard as it can possibly move. And we're still watching the threats grow. So we have to look for a new solution and very organically through broader and more inclusive communication processes through a, a very conscious effort to decentralize decision-making further and further down into the field through a whole series of steps like that, where we ended up was, wow, we've, we've created this sort of dual access system where we have traditional top-down structure as a baseline and stability. And we have the ability to move very quickly as a, as a network sort of model. So those two things couple together as this sort of hybrid structure. Now, had there been a master plan out of the gates, because the thinking was so new, it probably would have gotten more pushback than just organically navigating toward things that, that were working and, and throwing away those that, that weren't. I don't know, it's a hypothetical, so it's hard to, hard to judge. But I think there was a certain advantage to saying, hey, let's, we're all in this together. Let's figure out what it looks like. And what we ended up at was a, was a very deliberate model that we found is repeatable in other spaces. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about, I, I can understand how this hybrid approach, where you have a structure, solid line hierarchy with this more distributed network model as well, how that would be great for the military in fighting the war on terror when you're also fighting a networked enemy. T- take this to the business. Like, How does this apply to the business? Why should a business start looking to making maybe going transition to a hybrid model where it's not just solid line hierarchy, but also uh, a more networked organization? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's interesting when I left the service in 2012, started having deeper conversations with folks in industry. That wasn't that long ago, but this sort of thinking, I think, was still n- new to a lot of folks in, in, in industry, in, in big government outside of the military, in big systems like healthcare, et cetera. But now I think we're seeing, you know, just click on the news any day. We're seeing such rapid change and traditional systems getting attacked by, you know, new players in almost every way that people start to realize, okay, there's, there's something going on that's, that's different than it was 20 years ago. This is not a battlefield or terrorism based problem. So this, the solution set, I think speaks to the, the idea that, look, your, your traditional system, you, you, you know, if you run a company that's been around for 80 years and you, you, you're, you're doing really well, you've built a model that's based on facing similar sort of competitors. So if I want to compete in your space, I'm going to read your playbook. I'm going to look at your history. I'm going to try to build out a, a similar system, but with a, a more efficient model. I want better talent. I want to build a better widget, whatever the, whatever we're competing over. And then I'm going to, I'm going to sl- start to slowly eat up your market share. I'm going to, I can come up with a very deliberate way to attack you and, and also become a big player. And maybe one day I'll completely usurp you and I'll buy you. And I, now I'm the dominant player. Right. So we've all seen that work. So the focus is, you know, how do we, how do I become more efficient? How do I optimize my system? How do I get the better talent? We're competing directly with each other. Now, those systems are still very important because there are big competitors, but there's also a, a totally different type of competition that doesn't play by any, any of those rules. The in, interconnected sort of external actors, startups that can scale overnight or don't need to scale. They can just release a new technology that just disrupts your, the market that you're in, or a consumer base that can interconnect in a way and, you know, debunk a new product that, that you've released before it even hits the market. A, a consumer experience where someone enters one of your stores or, you know, the recent United example is, is just perfectly illustrates this where you have, you know, a problem on an aircraft and, and a system that isn't quite comfortable yet decentralizing all the way down to truly empowered folks at a gate that say, this is escalating. We're gonna we're gonna put in a lot of you know more time or money right now here in the moment than we would have traditionally, but we're gonna solve this problem. Instead, when you have to do lot, rely on sort of a traditional approach, it can cost you know millions of dollars in 
shareholding over, you know, in a very, very brief period of time, if you're not comfortable creating that decentralized model down to those that are closest to the problem. The problems aren't new. They've always existed. The, the issue is these problems can now interconnect, be shared, and drive thinking about your organization in, at a speed and at a scale that traditionally they, they simply couldn't. So I would argue that the traditional systems really don't have a choice. Organizations will not be run the same way they are now in 20, 25 years. So we are in this transition point. I would argue that this hybrid, hybrid sort of structure is, a, is one way to bridge through this transition. But those that are convinced that the 20th century model will continue to be the right solution as the information age gets more and more complex, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a pretty rough road to be on right now. So the planning cycle is getting shorter and shorter. I mean, it used to be where you could plan for a year then maybe a quarter. Now you have to like, it's maybe it's just day to day or maybe hour to hour. You have to be able to make decisions that fast. Yeah, I think so. I, but I think you have to be able to do both. I mean, there is long-term planning where you, you know, you want to know where you recruit from and you, you want to have a relationship with that graduate school or whatever the case may be. You want to have a good intern program that you get to look at over people over multiple years. So those aren't minute to minute decisions. Those are deliberate relationships that are built over time. In the military, you're not, you know, minute to minute deciding what the next aircraft carrier is going to look like. Those are, you know, long time horizon programs. And so you don't need some sort of d- distributed system that's capable of dealing with sheer chaos in a system like that that you can control. I'm not saying it's easy. Those are, you need a lot of smart people that know how to manage things very well from people to money to communication plans, et cetera. But whether you like it or not, there are also spaces that that move in that minute to minute fashion. And so back to our experiences in the counterterrorism world, you couldn't say, well, let's just completely focus on empowering the teams on the ground so that they can move minute to minute when they're, when they're in, you know, literally in the, in the target environment and cast away the fact that we still have to come up with a training plan for next year, or we still have to recruit people over a multi-year time horizon. So those two things need to live in, in congruence with each other. The, the hard part though, is that the, the fact that there are minute to minute things that can disrupt you. That's just the reality. Now organizations need to have a system in place. That's, that's capable of dealing with that, which is why you have to get comfortable living on these two axes at the same time. So let's, let's dig into a little bit of how you develop sort of the how-to, the nuts and bolts of this uh, team of teams approach. In one mission, you talk about the first step is developing or having a mission focus. Is that something like a corporate mission statement that people roll their eyes out or is it something else? You know, it's interesting. So we talk a lot about this idea of creating the right type of aligning narrative in one mission. And yeah, every, everybody's got the poster on the wall that says, you know, be the best or whatever the case may be. And those are, there for good reason, those can become eye rollers. And I'm sure the task force that I was part of under, under McChrystal had some version of that that I was never aware of, or maybe I was, I just can't recall it at that point. The problem is they don't, they don't really have enough meaning when it comes to connecting different parts of the organization. And so what we, we lay out in, in one mission is our leadership started to change that from whatever sort of bumper sticker narrative it might have been to a story that really forced us at the at the low level to make a choice. And what we had inside of this our our global task force was a culture that's not unlike you'll see in big big enterprise, where we had these incredibly capable, proud, very tribal verticals. So I was part of the SEAL teams. Army units had their versions of that. We had Air Force folks. We had interagency, like intelligence teams that became part of our task force. And when you went far enough down onto the ground, each of those groups had a really strong, powerful grip on their members, which served us really well for for a long time. And it, 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 it means a lot to be part of the SEAL teams. Obviously, you go through you know, many, many years of wickets to, to reach that level. And you, the, the, the tribe speaks a certain language. It carries itself a certain way. It wears its hair a certain way. All those little nuances mean a lot when you're in the, in the system. And when you look at another tribe that is on the same big org chart on the wall, they're, the way they carry themselves is a little different. They wear their uniforms a little different. The language they use is slightly different. So there's an immediate uncertainty about, are they really part of the same organization? And all of us, we're all human. So you'll default back to your your tribe and say, this is where I'm comfortable. Now, the problem we found that 
that led to in a very interconnected fight where the threats have one common story that they're just bolting people onto to create action. And we find that we have little different nuances between our our organizations that can lead to massive uh, separation when it actually comes to trying to fight this interconnected network. So what the narrative that our senior leadership started to talk to us about was at a very high cultural level saying, look, we we are not coming together as a holistic organization. We do not trust each other between tribes. We do not have genuine cross-boundary relationships that allow one unit to pick up a phone to a, another unit and say, here's what I think is going on. And you listen to them as if they were part of your own team that you trust and and believe their their optic on the fight as much as you would believe somebody in your own tribe. Until we get to that level as an organization, we will not be as interconnected as the threat we were, fa- we were facing. And even though we're stronger and faster and better trained and better equipped, all these things, they will still stay one step ahead of us. And so at that level of powerful narrative, that's not a bumper sticker on the wall. That's a call to action that says you can stay comfortable in t- inside of your tribe, or you can become part of this larger story that's going to truly pull us together as a as a, a you know one mission focus type organization, then we win. So the choice is up to you. Every single day, you're going to have to decide, do I want to stay comfortable in my tribe or do I want to be part of a culture that has the potential to win in this environment? And so that was a, it, you know, that didn't happen overnight. That was a consistent conversation that went on for weeks, months, and then just became the DNA of the, of the organization. But the, for me personally, coming up through that system, that was the most powerful part of what our leaders did for us was forcing us to truly think about which which hand we wanted to play. Do I want to be comfortable in my tribe or do I want to get uncomfortable and try to be part of this bigger bigger thing? So the part of developing that one mission team of teams approach is this idea of shared consciousness where everyone's on the same page. So the idea of shared consciousness is basically everyone has that one mission focus no matter what team they're on, what tribe they're part of. But also there's a shared consciousness of the information that's available there and how it affects all the other organizations, right? So maybe the SEAL, maybe the SEALs have some bit of information that might be useful to another organization. I, I think people understand on the macro level, but how do you do that? How do you get that shared consciousness going across organizations so that people are all on the same page? Shared consciousness is one of those things that mo- most people have experienced. You know, if you've been in a startup, if you've been on a high performance sports team, anytime you've been in an environment where there's six of us or 12 of us or 20 of us and we all connect emotionally and we all are close enough in physical proximity or we, we resynchronize ourselves with enough, uh, at, at a fast enough pace that I can understand what you're thinking. You can understand what I think. That's, that's shared consciousness. Most people have felt that at some point, but they'll describe a, I would describe a SEAL platoon. You might describe a startup that you were part of or a sports team you were on. So how do you scale that up to the enterprise level became the, the, the big debate. And I remember our senior leadership when we were going through this transition saying, we are, you know, our core strength is our, is our small teams, our, our ranger platoons on the ground that just move with complete fluidity. Is it possible to scale that up to this global enterprise level? Because if we can do that, no one can keep up with us. Um, but it seems sort of like a, a, a pretty big challenge, right? So uh, very organically, what became the backbone of creating that sort of structure was increased periodicity. So the speed with which we Resynchronized ourselves went up exponentially. And then the amounts of personnel involved in those resynchronizing communication structures also went up. So we started to ask the question, how fast is the threat externally changing? And can we realign ourselves to marry up with that pace? Now there's a whole history to how we got there, but essentially the takeaway was these networks, Al Qaeda and networks like this, there's something different every morning. When they wake up, they look around, they say, what are we going to do today? And they redesign who's talking to who and what they're going to, what they're going to execute in the next 24 hours. So that's a, that's the cycle that we needed to keep up with. Now, this was happening multiple layers above where I was in, in the organization at that point, but that's the conversations that they started to, to drive. Then they backed that up and said, okay, if that's 24 hours, how do we resynchronize ourselves every 24 hours in or, in order to be able to keep up with that pace? So we, over time, started to look at the battlefield in these 24-hour cycles. The first 90 minutes of that cycle would start with a global video teleconference. And in time, that grew to thousands of people around the world sitting in this one common forum every 24 hours, seven days a week for years on end, 
developing this sense of shared consciousness. And it wasn't a top down, here's what you're going to do today. It wasn't a mid management, let me update everybody on what's going on. It was a 90 minute discussion about how people were seeing the problem. What was the new data? What teams had gone out into the fight and learned something new? Very raw and honest discussions about what was actually happening inside the problem. Then you could go into these windows of decentralization. So you, you'd have thousands of people that would walk out with that same sense that you and I might have if it's a three or four person startup after our morning cup of coffee. And we say, okay, let's go, let's go get them. Same, same thing was happening, but with thousands of people around the globe. So then we would go into 22 hours of truly decentralized operations where you could push responsibility deep down into the uh, units that were on the ground. And then 22 and a half hours later, they resynchronize and we have the same conversation. Is it, you know, no single day was ever perfect, but over time, you marry all these things up and you truly created this global enterprise with a sense of shared consciousness that you would find inside a, a 12 person platoon, for example. Okay. So, uh, the regular 90 minute meeting, right? And I think people hear that. And I think you sort of mentioned it's not like a management update meeting, right? It's like, here's what's going on. It's something different. So, like, say someone wanted, they have a business, and they want to incorporate this sort of cross communications amongst different organizations within the company or their own business if they have one. What, what's like the agenda? Like, how do you start that meeting? Is it just like you have a topic? I mean, what, what, what are the, the mechanics of that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. The, the temptation is to say, okay, got it. Let's, let's do that on Monday and we'll get, you know, we'll get 500 regional managers onto a call and we'll just start talking about stuff. Well, that's, of course, we know where that's going to go. It's just going to turn into total chaos, right? So if, when we're doing work with organizations, we will start with what we did very organically inside the, the task force underneath McChrystal, which was starting with a conversation of, okay, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? What's, What's our strategic intent as an organization? That quickly led for, to us and what you'll see in large organizations is there's actually multiple different fights going on here. So we're, we're not on the same page about what our strategic intent is and how we're going to get there. So, so that's, that's this place I would say for any organization to start. Get, get the leadership together, really determine what's our strategy, what are we trying to accomplish, cascade that down into your verticals, your regions, however you're structured. And that, you know, that will change over time, but you have to get some sort of common baseline. Then from that, you can start to look at the speed with which the problems are moving. You know, so you probably have a traditional system that's capable of moving in that linear fashion versus big traditional competition. What are the other problems and how fast are they changing to deal with those in a decentralized fashion? How often do you have to resynchronize? So you start with those two ideas. What are we trying to accomplish? How often do we have to realign to be able to do it in a decentralized manner? Then you can get into the creation of this sort of communication model based on those former two. So, and the agenda itself will be informed by the first work you do, which is what are we trying to accomplish? So as, you, and then you can grow these things steadily over time. If the goal is to have 500 regional managers involved in something like this, start with 10 then make it 30, then make grow in time over to, to, to that large number. And because you want people to show up and every time they, they come into a forum like this, say, I'm a busy person, but that's the best hour I spend this during the week. Or that's the best two hours I spend every other week. Because I walk away with a real understanding of how the leaders throughout the organization are looking at the problem. And I'm very comfortable now operating in a decentralized fashion until we resynchronize. So it's, it's, it's a driver of human behavior as much as, as anything. Now for us, the, the structure of it was, uh, was important. Um, the, there had to be a solid backbone. We had a, we had a very consistent agenda that was uh, consistent as much that we, we always had one. It was very structured, 90 minutes. We knew ahead of time who was going to talk about what for, how much time, et cetera. If you went to our portal system, that was the first thing you'd see on the homepage was the agenda for the next cycle. So very transparent there. What was being talked about would, would change over time based on what was going on in the fight. But people needed that baseline to say, okay, here's what we're going to talk about. I understand what how the senior leaders are seeing the fight based on the type of agenda they're structuring. Then we would use a, a controller, and we highly recommend this to any organization, train and develop an individual or team, depending on the size of the enterprise, that is responsible for making sure that this thing's run, a forum like this runs smoothly, uh, working with the IT backbone, making sure that briefers are prepared, coaching them along to like, here's the type of conversations we try to have, 
keeping the schedule running on time, taking taskers and follow-ups so that you can you can push, you know, things that need to go into a sidebar discussion, you you can follow up on those. There's a whole bunch of tricks that you want to do in that space to keep it nicely controlled and functioning. And then we would use a a sort of a technology backdrop as well. I mean, our technology then was was pretty rudimentary compared to what is available now. But of those, if we had thousands of people on the net, a good majority of them would have a device open, like you'd be on your classified laptop, and you'd have a series of chat rooms going during this forum. So that in the conversation itself, there's, you know, these point to point conversations going on with other people contributing sort of uh, additional information based on the conversation that you didn't want that to turn into total chaos. In the backdrop, you would have 10, 12, you know, maybe more individual or big party chat rooms going on your laptop. So as you're briefing some new insight that you've discovered in one corner of the world, I can reach out to dozens of contacts and say, hey, that's really interesting what they're talking about right now. Have you seen that report? What do you know about that new piece of equipment they're describing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a constant interruption and chaos. The chaos can happen in the backdrop. So those were, that gave us the opportunity to create those, those new dotted line networks every single time we resynchronized these. You created the best possible opportunity for the right people to connect and say, Oh, wow, I didn't know that. We can create a sub network very quickly. That's going to solve for that issue. Or I'm going to do something differently in the next 22 hours based on what that person just said. So it, that, that, and that's why so many people were drawn to be part of something like that. So if we had thousands of people on the net, most of that was organic growth. Most of that was people deciding I want to be in this forum because it gives me the opportunity to create my own sub networks every 24 hours and tackle the, the issues we're facing in, in, in a new way. Yeah. As I was reading the sort of the mechanics of it, if I was thinking like Slack could be a tool for a, a small company who doesn't have the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure to build their own platform. But I think it's the same sort of thing. You have sort of a main channel where you're, everyone's getting the same updates, but then you can go off into little channels uh, on your own and discuss things about the main channel. Exactly right. I mean, we, we use a combination. I mean, and, and this technology is, you know, there's no barrier of entry for anyone. You can get freeware as a startup between Slack and other systems that are out there and quickly create this, this sort of structure. But, uh, yeah, we, we use Slack in our own organization and it, it's a much prettier version of what we were using at the time, which looked basically like sort of MS DOS chat rooms. But, uh, but yeah, that coupling those two things together, I think today is, is critical. All right. So, uh, let's talk the, the hybrid approach. The, the benefit of it is it gives you have that solid line hierarchy where you can do some long term planning and make sure you know, the things that require long-term planning and logistics get done, but you also have this networked approach. And this, But this networked approach gives on-the-ground subordinates a lot of autonomy to make quick decisions for themselves based on information they've gotten from this shared consciousness that they've received from these updates or whatever else, or whatever is communication that they're using. How do you ensure that these autonomous individuals don't deviate too far from the the mission focus with their decisions because it's one thing like hey get out there and just do it but then they might do something really stupid that hurts the <laughs> mission yeah yes they might uh, and you know what's interesting is i remember as a as a junior officer in these communities when my own sort of naive view on things at the time was oh they're going to decentralize and empower and we're going to be flat and basically what you just described, like this will be kind of up to me and, and our team and we'll just go for it. And then we come back every often, every so often and tell them what, what we're doing. Well, that's, that's not how it works. And that, you know, in our environment and, and any high risk or, you know, big enterprise system that can create way more risk than it, than it's worth. If you just say, okay, everybody go for it and then we'll resynchronize. Cause you, you might be a very seasoned actor and I'm brand new. There's no way I should be empowered or held to the same level of accountability that, that you should be. So what I'll describe here, again, happened sort of through organic conversations over time inside of our initial environment. But there's a very deliberate approach that organizations can take to create this model if they start with that original discussion around strategy and cascading that down into sort of measurable metrics within teams, which is an old sort of management model, but very critical baseline that it can provide. So if you have that in place, you can then come down to, you know, me, you, and one other person as, let's say, back to the regional sales manager model. If you're, you know, six years in that position, the, the higher level leadership can say, okay, here are the 
20 things we're going to empower you to do with at your level. So you, you don't come back in and check for permission. When we're in these windows of sort of de- decentralized action, you own all of that. Here are two or three things that I'm going to going to constraints that I'm going to put on top of you because we're in a volatile market when it comes to joint ventures. If you're talking to any of these three competitors, check in with headquarters because, you know, there's new sort of legal constraints. If you're, if you're encroaching into this sort of environment, check in with leadership, everything else up to you. So that makes a lot of sense to you. You're probably, okay, I'm a seasoned, experienced leader. I, I understand why I'm constrained, but I'm also I know where I'm expected to act with speed and independence. If I've just been promoted up to regional sales manager, I might have three things that I can do at my level and 20 things that I'm constrained by. And that list can get very, very detailed, which things like this happen in a lot of organizations. You know, you have different sorts of actors, but when you took that sort of measured approach and you can do this in great detail inside an organization, if you, if you want to roll your sleeves up, you can literally map this out. Coupled with the inclusion and transparent nature of the communication forums that were, were put into place, you could literally see every single day as a new actor in the system. I understand my constraints. I understand my authorities. But every 24 hours, I'm getting a new opportunity to see somebody like you, a seasoned member of the organization, talk and operate at a much higher level. We might be peers on an org chart, but you have all these other authorities and I can see you leverage them. I can see the actions you take. And more importantly, I can see how you tie your actions and new information that you might be finding back up into the strategic conversation. So as a new actor in that in that model, you're probably, even if we're on paper peers, you're thinking multiple levels above me. And every day, you're unintentionally, you're coaching me to become an actor like you. And so I see what right looks like. M- most Traditional bureaucracies, when that happens, it happens behind closed doors. So I see you as a uh, competitor. I don't understand. I think the bosses just like you more. Be- and I don't have time to sit down. And you don't have time to sit down and coach me along. And you might be incentivized not to do that based on myriad of things inside of an enterprise. But in a transparent system like this, I can just see it happening. And when the, the reverse was also true for us, when a seasoned player could look across and see me as a, as a new member of the organization who is highly constrained, you were also in- incentivized to reach across and coach me, literally picking up the phone and saying, here's where you can improve. Here's how you should be thinking about the following. If you want these sorts of authorities, here's what our leadership needs to see from you. That was not necessarily because you thought I was a great guy, but every time I pick up the phone to ask permission around one of those constraints that are layered on me, I'm preventing our senior leadership just because I'm eating up their time from doing the up and out thinking that you want them to do. You don't need permissions. You need new relationships with other organizations. You need you know, new funding for a massive strategic project you're focused on. I need permission to go from A to B. So you want me to either figure out how to get to from A to B on my own or just get out of the way, right? So you're incentivized to come over and, and help coach me along to get there. So it also starts to act as a tool for breaking down those tribal barriers between different verticals, different regions, where normally there's a sense of competition. Now people can see, wow, if I make, if I make that team better, it's going to greatly benefit my team as well. So, yeah, you gave a good example of this on the ground coaching where, you know, you get a call from some other guy in another organization kind of chewing you out, <laughs> but he, he you know, a coaching experience. So yeah, again, it's, it takes, it takes a lot of conscious, uh, intentional, deliberate work to make this approach work in an organization. No, that's right. But it's, it's, and you know, what, what, what's described in one mission, I would say, you know, there's, there's a whole series of basics in there, but coupling them together at a pace that keeps up with today's environment, that's the challenge because it's not good enough anymore to come out and be really good once a quarter at the town hall or to be really good on your, you know, quarterly analyst report. You got to be as good as you can be every single day if you're going to expect the organization to be able to move fast enough. So you talk about this in the book. The military doesn't just rely on organizations within the, the, the military. They also work with outside parties where they don't have control over them, but they're a vital part of the mission. I'm sure there's a lot of businesses, too, that work with th- outside entities to further their mission and their business strategic goals but they don't have control over them. You know, for example, my own business, I use a lot of independent contractors, right? For video editing, whatever. 
how can you apply this team of teams approach with these outside third parties so you can work with them and maintain that rapid operating tempo that you need to survive and thrive in today's uh, world? Yeah, a few things changed in in the way that this task force was run by by our senior leadership on that front that I think are applicable over over to many other parts of industry. One being people have to feel like they're part of the the team, right? So I, I think especially so in today's world. So even if I'm a contractor doing, you know, editing for you, I want to feel like I'm part of the mission that you're accomplishing because that's the sense that everybody, we're, we're so interconnected now that uh, people are looking for sort of the purpose behind any particular thing they're, they're doing. So we try to leverage that same sort of emotional connection with, with any outside entity. So people were, weren't just welcome to work for us or be attached to us. They they were pulled in as part of the team. So I'll give you an example from like the, the, the SEAL community. Historically, you might deploy to a conflict zone. This is going back, you know, many years and why sort of first came into that environment. And you might have, you know, a, uh, a young civilian intelligence expert from some, you know, outside entity who based on his or her sort of background or experience, they're going to be part of your part of your team and they're going to advise on XYZ. And so the because of the tribalism, there was, you know, a bias toward, okay, this is uh, you know, Karen and Karen, here's your office over here down the hall, and here's the team room, and here's where we eat and work out, and here's where you know you can use this gym down the road and that sort of thing. Like we appreciate what you bring to the table. Here's the meetings that you're invited to, but we're we're the team and you're an additional capability. It's sort of exaggerating it, but we've all felt that sort of pressure and, and we're certainly part of the sort of the tribal nature of these teams. And what our leadership forced us to, to change toward and think through was Karen needs to be part of this, this team. And that doesn't mean on paper, she's assigned to your unit for X number of months. It means she's in your headquarters. She knows how you think. She sits through all the meetings. She is in your chow hall. She uses your workout facilities. She is integrated into how you operate as a culture. And then her subject matter expertise will be able to be much more effectively leveraged uh, inside of your thinking. She becomes part of your OODA loop, so to speak, as we were talking about um, earlier, which if you're trying to take a linear approach where, you know, the, the tribe will think about it to this level, we hit this brick wall, then we call in Karen and she drops in this one amazing insight and then we solve the issue. That's just completely unrealistic unreal- in this in today's age. She needs to be part of that from step one, not just in the information sharing, but in the way that that culture interacts with one another and the way it sees the problem. So that was one big part of it internally to teams, like pulling people in and really making them part of your of your tribe. The, the, the other was external. As you talk about external partners, our, our leadership used the liaison model, which is not new in the military, in a wholly different way. So the, the idea of exchanging folks between different organizations goes, you know, far back in military history. But part of their function historically was just to make sure that, you know, units didn't run into each other and that uh, next moves were aligned between different parts of the battlefield, those sorts of things. So it's a pretty transactional position and you could, you didn't need to put a, a super high performer in to be able to do that. It could be a junior person, it could be a, a B player that kind of didn't have a home in the unit, etc. Uh, but in the, the speed of the battlefield made that old model just just totally ineffective. So our leadership started grabbing very seasoned folks from the battlefield that were clearly on a track, a high performance track, and were going to be senior leaders inside the organization in short order, where the units would be tempted, like, this is where I want to grab this person and put them in charge of this unit that's in the t- toughest part of the fight. They instead would have, you know, they'd, they'd drop their body armor and weapons put on a suit and tie and go work in a civilian intelligence agency or work at an embassy or work in a, in a non-traditional capacity under the title of liaison. But what they really were was a senior enough and insightful enough individual that they connect directly with senior leadership in those other spaces. And they were tethered directly into our senior leadership. So you had this amazing web of connectivity between our sort of hybrid system and these other actors that they could run their organization however they saw fit. But when when what we were doing needed to get to those other enterprises with, with network level speed, you had all these positions embedded inside of them that could quickly walk into the offices of the most senior leaders and say, Sir, ma'am, here's exactly what you need to understand right now. Here's what we're doing to, you know, handle the situation. We'd like your guidance, input, et cetera. I can get you on a phone call right now with our senior leadership. We're going to have a video teleconference on this in 10 minutes. You're invited to sit through and, and sort of guide it from your direction. They felt like they were truly part of that, that enterprise based on the connectivity that those liaisons provided. And I think you can do similar sorts of models in, 
in industry. We've, we've, we've done it inside of uh, global enterprises, establishing these sorts of positions between, you know, uh, global regions, et cetera. Or if you're working with outside actors, like here's a, a joint venture partner or, a, you know, even a friend of me in a space, like we have to start exchanging people. So we really understand how each other is seeing this, the, the market so that we can best leverage uh, our collective strengths. It's a, I think it's a very universal system. That's awesome. Well, Chris, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about your work? Yeah. So, uh, the McChrystal group is just, you know, we hop on our website, see some of the work we do. And one mission is out, uh, 13 June. So we're excited about it, its release and hopefully be hear- hearing more about that. If they want to sort of understand the depth and background, you can start there and then go back to team of teams or the other way around. But between the, the two of those, there's a, there's a sort of a story about our experiences and how we think it applies to other spaces. Fantastic. Well, Chris Fussell, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. I really appreciate it. My guest today was Chris Fussell. He's the author of the book, One Mission. You can find that on amazon.com. You can also find more information about his work at mccrystalgroup.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Fussell, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.